Mindful Schools has been in 40 plus schools in the last four years, reaching 11,000 kids. Generally, the results we're seeing are increased focus and concentration, so the ability to pay attention in class, um, improved self-awareness, the ability of just recognizing how you're feeling, when you're feeling it, which leads to impulse control, which I think is probably the most appealing entry point for education, is that mindfulness helps create impulse control, and that self-awareness also leads to empathy and the way we interact with others. Mindfulness is useful for schools because it addresses a wide range of issues that aren't traditionally addressed through pure academic learning. One is that it prepares the brain to learn. Research is showing that mindfulness calms the brain in a way that actually makes their brain um, have a higher capacity of functioning. Um, so one thing is just preparing the brain to learn, so being prepared for academics. And the other thing is that it's addressing the social-emotional side of learning and the social-emotional side of life. And I really believe that it's important to nurture the social-emotional side and the academic side in school. And I believe that one should not be neglected at the expense of the other. I think that they both serve each other. Mindfulness creates more self-awareness so that you notice how you feel in different situations. So that when you are doing something um, that's harmful to yourself or to someone else, you recognize that feeling and it's more likely that you'll stop doing it. When I'm in the classroom and I see kids gaining this skill, I often see this um, trajectory, these two different trajectories. Uh, you have a, a first grader who is being sent to the office regularly because they can't pay attention. And because they can't pay attention, they're poking their neighbor, or they're crawling under their desk, or they're asking to go to the bathroom. And you give them a skill that helps them focus and helps them uh, maintain more autonomous control over their body and over their attention. And then you're setting this different trajectory. They're no longer being sent to the office. They're in the class and they're getting educated and both of those options lead to different places. And so to feel like there's a skill that they're cultivating is really gratifying. Research is showing that mindfulness does affect the brain and that it helps to cultivate uh, sort of social behavior that is uh, uh, facilitated through our prefrontal cortex. And so it, mindfulness is, is increasing things like self-regulation and bodily regulation, fear modulation, um, intuition in the sense that uh, our visceral organs are reacting before our mind gets involved. So the more self-awareness we have around our physical reaction, the more quickly and um, accurately we can respond to different situations. So we did lots of different lessons with the kids. We did mindful listening and mindful breathing in every class. And uh, those are sort of the pillars of the class. As long as we get a little bit of mindful listening and mindful breathing in, I feel like um, we've given them uh, something for that day. And mindful listening is just opening up to your sense door of sound and being deliberate in noticing sound and not reacting to the sound, not, not um, interacting with the sound, but just noticing that sound is happening. And using the bell for that gives something to focus on. And when you have a sustained attention on sound, it allows the mind to sort of settle down because it's just focusing on one thing. So it's really important to get that sustained attention piece in. It's important to have a particular posture in mindfulness because mindfulness is about uh, sort of a sharp mind or a strong mind or an attentive mind. And if your body is slouched, um, it sort of encourages the mind to be more sleepy or to slouch. And that's why we encourage people to sit upright and let your, your back be lifted. It, it naturally encourages the mind to be lifted. But um, doing mindfulness while you're walking obviously is okay, and um, even while you're lying down. And we often tell kids that mindfulness can help them fall asleep at night. So whereas in the class we want to use mindfulness to create some alertness, um, mindfulness can also be used at night when you are lying down and ready to sleep to help you relax. Mindful breathing is really important because so much of our emotions 
are responsive to our breathing or our breathing is responsive to our emotions. So it's a nice way to stay connected with your experience is to be watching or noticing your breathing. And it also is uh, something that is always happening. So we can, it's another place to practice sustained attention, noticing the entire breath for a sustained, uh, for a sustained amount of time. Um, again, gives the mind a place to settle or anchor or uh, remain. And it's, um, it's a tool for bringing the mind back in when it's wandered. Mindful eating can create a really concentrated class and it also can create a really rambunctious class. Uh, but the purpose of teaching mindful eating is, again, that we want to bring mindfulness into our entire experience, not just sitting still with our eyes closed and not just uh, difficult emotions. But mindful eating gives us a chance to experiment with being extra present in something that we do every day. And most people will relate to the idea that they throw food in their mouth, a handful of raisins or a handful of nuts, or you sit down to a plate full of food and suddenly it's gone. You know, you've just eaten it without noticing anything. And that when you take the time to eat something mindfully, you get to enjoy it in a way that uh, you don't normally give yourself time for. One of the things that mindfulness helps with is giving us an, uh, sort of an opening into our, our mind and our thoughts. Uh, it, it gives us a chance to see our thoughts, to notice that we think and what we think. And we have a few different lessons that we do to help kids recognize their thinking. But one of them we call past, present, future. And we want to help people identify, help students identify that often we're thinking about things in the past or in the future. And that rarely we're actually paying attention to the present. And in, for the seventh graders, uh, I, I talked about having different time zones of our attention and that we can be in the, the past time zone, the present time zone, or the future time zone. And the aim in mindfulness is to stay in the present time zone. And when we travel to the past or we travel to the future, our job in mindfulness is just to recognize, oh, I've been thinking about the future, or maybe, oh, I'm worried about the future or I've been thinking about the past, or maybe I'm regretting the past, or disappointed about something. And to recognize that those thoughts are just thoughts in that moment. And it gives a lot of empowerment to choose to come back to the present. And, and maybe that those future or past thoughts aren't serving us so much. One of the lessons that we do is called uh, the sound challenge. And it's an opportunity to practice being mindful when there's a lot of disturbance, a lot of sound. And this actually ends up being a lesson that kids really connect with and, and enjoy doing. And there's a variety of ways of doing this, but in general, uh, you ask the students to be mindful. So they sit in a mindful posture, they let their eyes close, they choose to focus on mindful listening or mindful breathing, and then either the teacher or some of the students make some noise in the class. And what this does is it really gives them the opportunity to practice paying attention to something on purpose and not responding to the external distraction or stimulus. And I think it's a really valuable lesson because if you think about it, when students are trying to study, either in the classroom or at home, there's often noise. You know, there's other kids talking or there's family or there's TV or there's radio or there's video games and there might not be a quiet place to go and it's really important to be able to focus your attention and not be distracted by things. The increase of technology and the amount of time kids spend behind a screen is making them more disengaged from their senses, from their sense doors, and from their experience around them, and from their internal life of thoughts and emotions. It's, I think that technology has a lot of great things, obviously we can't deny that, but it also can create a disconnect with yourself if you're not careful about how much you use it. And most people don't have a lot of discipline around that. And kids don't know the difference. You know, these kids these days have grown up with 
technology to the extent that it is and uh, they're using it as if it's just part of their life and they don't necessarily know the contrast between what it's like to not use it to that extent and how they can be more connected to themselves if they're not that plugged into technology. A large part of our program is called Heartfulness and we have a number of different lessons that help cultivate heartfulness and one of them is what we call sending kind thoughts. With the seventh graders, uh, I called it thinking on purpose. And I felt like that was a useful description to help them notice the difference between habitual thoughts that they might not notice they're having but are really impacting them and thoughts that we have on purpose or intentionally. And I wanted to help them access that place where they can make a choice over what they're thinking. And uh, in this case, our thoughts on purpose are sending kind thoughts to ourself or to others. And thoughts like wishing that, um, that I'm happy or wishing that you're happy or wishing that you're safe or wishing that I'm safe. And the value of thinking those thoughts on purpose is that the value of thinking those thoughts on purpose is that uh, we might have other thoughts that are the opposite of that that we're not noticing. They might be thoughts that something like I'm not good enough or I'm a failure or I'm unhappy or my life is screwed up. And if those thoughts are really habitual and they're consistent but we're not seeing them, then they're creating this undercurrent of impression that we are sort of approaching our life with. And if we can give um, a countering thought like I wish that I wish for myself to be happy, or I wish for myself to be peaceful, or I wish for myself to be successful. You get to change the tone of your thinking pattern. And I think it's an incredibly important skill uh, when we're young to be recognizing our thinking tone and be able to change it to something that's positive and that serves us. Another thing that mindfulness helps with is our emotions. And the way we get in touch with our emotions through mindfulness is by noticing how emotions feel in our body and noticing the activity that they create in our mind. And most emotion manifests in our body in a way that's quite noticeable. And you can ask anybody, you know, tell me when you get angry, where do you feel anger in your body? And it might be different for different people. Some people might feel it in their chest. Some might feel it in their stomach. Some might notice their hands tighten. Some might notice that their head gets hot or tight. And uh, where it is is not important. It's that you're noticing it. And we spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of our attention um, looking externally or paying attention to things outside of us and we haven't really cultivated the ability to stay very present in our body so we have some lessons on keeping our attention in our body and when you are not having a strong emotion you can place your attention in your feet in your hands in your chest in your shoulders in your legs in your belly and just notice how that body how that part of your body feels and when you practice that, then you're more able to check in to how your body feels when an intense emotion arises. And that allows you to notice the emotion is happening, check into how it feels in your body. And if you can stay with the physical sensation, you have a lot more power or control over how you're going to respond to that emotion.